Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Well, Reveille Church, let me say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you are seeing this, I need you to know how excited and glad I am to be here and to be in ministry in the coming seasons together with you in these days to come. It is a, a treat, and I'm really excited to be a part of all the things that God is going to do in these days to come. Now, I will admit, when all these things began five months ago, and I found out, we found out, that I was going to be appointed here, we did not envision this day like this. Uh, we didn't envision a first time together being pre-recorded to a virtually empty sanctuary. But yet we are here, and at the same time, we are thankful for technology and for the many people who are working so hard to make sure we have a great worship service despite the circumstances. I have so enjoyed uh, being a part of Zoom calls with many of, group, many of the groups here and many of you, and I know I have many more to go, uh, but I am thankful for the opportunities we've had, even though they are virtual, to get to know you and to spend some time with all of you. Um, as we get started, I wanted to offer a scripture that I have found to be thematic for my life, and I hope you will hear it uh, in the same way. It's the familiar story as Jesus turns the water to wine in the second chapter of John. Will you listen now for the word of God? On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the gift of technology that despite the challenging circumstances around us, we are able to still gather and worship and proclaim your word and remember the wonder of who you are. Lord, as we remember you and as we turn to you, it is our prayer that you would put your spirit upon us in a generous way that you would take the water within us and turn it to wine once again so that we might rise up in glory for you. It is in the name of Jesus we offer this prayer. As all God's people say, Amen. Well, you are probably familiar with this story. Again, John places it first in his gospel for a very intentional reason. He wants you and I, as we share with the children, he wants us to know who Jesus is. And he's offering this story to do exactly that. So Jesus comes to Cana of Galilee, and he shows up with his disciples. And they come to this wedding, a very big event in ancient Palestine. But perhaps because he brought some extra people, they run out of wine. And for that to occur in that day and age was would be a huge social stigma that would have gone on for decades of conversation. And so it was, it was very important that this issue be fixed. So you heard Mary. She turns to Jesus and 
tells him about the problem. And what's fascinating in that as she turns to Jesus is to hear the way that she addresses him. Now, very likely, Jesus was the oldest son of the family. And most likely, Joseph had died, and now Mary was a widow. And Jesus, being the oldest son, was the go-to person. When things go south, Mary clearly probably went to, to, jo- to Jesus to fix the problem. And you see, that's exactly what she did here. When they ran out of wine, she turns to Jesus and in, in so many wor- words asks him to fix it. But then Jesus turns to her and offers a loving corrective, or in some commentators would say a loving rebuke. Because what we're finding here in this story is his identity has changed. No longer is he the carpenter's son, the son of Mary, and only that. He's assuming this new identity. And even Mary has to come to him as he is. And in the story, as you heard, that's exactly what she does. She she hears that new identity, and to her credit, she says... She tells the servants to do exactly what he says to do. And sure enough, the servants fill these six stone jars of water and fill them to the brim. Now each of them them held from 20 to 30 gallons. And they were used for ceremonial washing, John tells us. This is so that the the religious authorities, when they came to to the wedding, they could wash their hands just so with the water so that they would be ceremonially clean. Well, of course, all those jars filled to the brim with water, Jesus changes to wine, right? 150 gallons of water, he turns to wine, the best wine. And then, of course, John tells us uh, why that miracle was there, so that Jesus could reveal his glory, and then the disciples believed in him. Well, the story has many meanings, but perhaps the premier point is that, as we said earlier, John is trying to introduce who Jesus is and what Jesus has come to do. You know, when you read through the pages of the Gospel of John, again and again, you hear this thematic word, life. Life. And John's not going to give you an academic conversation about what that life is or, or a detached discussion. Instead, what John does is the very first miracle, he presents this to give us a picture of what life in Jesus is all about. What Jesus has come to this world, to this earth, to this church, to us. What He has come to do. And to understand this definition of life, think about uh, the difference between water and wine. I mean, water we need. We can survive off water. We can get by off water. But you can't live just off water spiritually, the way life is meant to be. The point of the story is that wine, without the excess, right, without the excess, wine represents this very real life that is offered to anybody in the person of Jesus Christ, right? You think about the color of wine, the richness of wine, the joy of wine, the flavor and celebratory nature of wine. All that is there to give us this vivid, colorful picture of life that can occur in the context and uniquely in the context of the person of Jesus. All that joy and all that hope and all that flavor. But also, we know, wine doesn't represent just that. We know the rest of the story that wine also represents the blood of Christ. And as such, it represents sacrifice and a surrender of our will to the will of God and represents our call to serve and go without and put others before ourselves. All that also is captured in this image of life. It's not just joy and celebration and flavor. That flavor also entails sacrifice and service. But in the story, when you think about it, and to push it a little farther, you see, you and I are the stone jars of this story. Our churches are the stone jars. This world is the stone jar. Our marriages are the stone jars. On our own, we are filled with water, and we can live, and we can survive, and we can grind it out, and we can get by. But what John is telling us 
is that when Jesus comes onto the scene, he changes our water to wine. Do you see the point? Jesus comes into our life and transforms survival into life. Jesus comes into our life and transforms our emptiness into life. Jesus comes in and grinding it out and getting by and a nominal existence, it turns into life. A good life becomes a great life. And what can be for us this contemporary idolatrous pursuit of happiness that captures so much of our attention? He can turn that pursuit of happiness to actually claim joy. And that means that no matter what, for you and me, there's hope. Jesus came into our earthly circumstances where we're just getting by and grinding it out, and he changes it to hopeful life. And that means that Jesus can still do it. He can still provide that life and do it abundantly, as we'll discover in just a few chapters. And friends, let me just say that this story helps me tell my story. Now please understand, my ministry is first and foremost about the person of Jesus Christ. For me, it's all about him. But as we begin our time together, I find it's a helpful way to talk to you about what has had brought me to this place and help you to understand who I am as we begin our season of, of work together. You know, like many perhaps of you, I grew up with a, a nominal faith. For me, growing up, going to church was kind of like breathing. It's just, just something you did. And that continued all the years through high school and college as I uh, pursued a degree in engineering in college. Uh, but then I uh, spent a good bit of my early career in the United States Navy. I was a, a Navy flyer. Uh, I flew an airplane called an A-6 intruder. I was what they called a bombardier navigator. I sat in the right seat and worked a lot of the systems there. And during those early years of my life, I flew all around the world. I had many, many hours in an airplane. I landed on an aircraft carrier many, many times and flew all around the world. I spent a good number of years as a flight instructor teaching young pilots how to fly this particular airplane. And I know it sounds and perhaps seems like a, like a very dynamic life, and it, and it certainly was. I often call that season of my life a, a pursuit of adrenaline and adventure. But I also know in retrospect that uh, a lot of that life was really driven with the need to fill an emptiness inside of me. You know, the trouble with spending a whole lot of time at sea, and I spent a year and a half at sea, is that uh, you spend a lot of time looking at a, at a lot of water. But what I have found is that I am in very good spiritual company in that place. John Wesley found a, a good part of his conversion experience occurred when he was at sea. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, the hymn, he too found faith staring at the water like I did. You know, it's fascinating when you spend a whole lot of days staring at a lot of water, and I, you know, I did that for a year and a half on two deployments. God talks to you, and it's, it reveals things to you. Not only are you looking at the vast expan expanse of water around you, but you realize if we go with the imagery of the story, the water that is inside of you instead of the wine that Christ uniquely offers. And you realize this point that maybe there could be more with this. And I bet many of you have hit that spot in your life at some time where God was talking to you and you found yourself at a crossroads realizing that there could be more than what is now. And we have a couple, we have a decision we can make at that point. And most, perhaps most often, we tend to double down, right? We pursue more relationship, or we pursue more money, or more success, or, or work harder to try to address that inherent emptiness inside of us. For me, um, by the grace of God, that, that didn't happen. I decided when I got back from sea, I was going to go to church. I hadn't been there for quite a while, and I ended up going to a church at Whidbey Island, Washington, about as far northwest in the United States as you can get, way north of Seattle in Puget Sound. And I got into this 
church building, and it was a massive sanctuary, and there was like 30 people in the room. And I listened to the sermon and wasn't really moved by it, and I, thought, I walked out of that church thinking, why am I here? When a young man came up to me and invited me to a Bible study at his house. Never met him before. Well, I went to that Bible study, and I ended up being in it for two years, and what I will say is that was transformational for me. That was the beginning of God's call on my life to pursue this path of ministry. And there's a lot of water and a lot of wine underneath that bridge uh, in those years, and we'll be talking more about that in the years to come. But what happened is God brought me into a different level of life. He changed my water into wine. And in so many places of my life, I found laughter, I found joy, and I found purpose. You know, Mark Twain uh, famously said some years ago that uh, about the two most important dates in your life. He said the most important, first most important date is the day you were born, but then he said the second most important date is the day you figure out why you were born. That's the gift of a relationship with Christ that turns water to wine. You find out why you were born and what your purpose in life is all about. And that is such a gift. Jesus turned my water to wine and gave me an incredible gift of the gift of an incredible wife in marriage we've been married for 33 years and uh, you're gonna meet her soon her name is lynn and uh, she has been a profound gift to me that would not have happened had it not been for what christ did in my life we have the gift of five incredible children you'll get to meet them at some point i have four girls and one boy I have four incredible son-in-laws and an incredible daughter-in-law, and we have three soon-to-be-four grandchildren. All that occurred, and I can say without reservation, that occurred because Christ changed my life, turning my water into wine. And also, that has changed my daily understanding of ministry and, and service and work. You know, many of you have gone on mission trips and you've had the opportunity to do something that sometimes we take for granted, spending a week or two with some of the poorest and most uh, uh, people who are struggling for life all around the world. I spent a lot of time traveling around the world in the Navy, pulling into ports and pulling into hotels and doing this and doing that, but it doesn't compare with the profound spiritual wonder of sitting with some of the people who live in poverty and struggle and oppression. And yet, they have the twinkle in their eyes and the joy of their hearts and the laughter in their hearts that despite the circumstances, they have clear evidence of the joy that Christ has put in their hearts. To see that in person and to be a part of it is a unique gift that does not come easily. And it's a gift that so many of you in mission trips around the world have done also. In an interesting way, this church, Reveille Church, has been a part of that throughout these 30-some years of of pursuing ministry. You know, many years ago when I was flying for the Navy, I was trying to pay the bills. I was in seminary at Union Seminary right here in Richmond. And uh, I would be paying the bills flying down in Virginia Beach. And one of those weekends, Lynn called me and she said to me, Pete, I found our church. I'm quoting her exactly. I have found our church. And she found this church. That was back in 1988. And uh, we joined this church, and you sent me into the ministry in this church. And I began uh, the career here in this this place. My daughter, Lauren, our oldest, was baptized. I'm looking right over. You can't see it, but I'm looking right over the baptismal font. And right there, 31 years ago, my daughter was baptized. And she was baptized by Bishop Kern Usler. And I remember sitting in the pews and listening to Bishop Usler preach. And you need to know, he was probably one of the best preachers in America in the 20th century. And what a gift it was to be able to listen to him. But what I remember most of all was one time when I was sitting in the front pew, and he was getting ready, and you can't see it, all, it's off camera here, but he was getting ready to ascend into that pulpit. And what was amazing about that picture was I was able to watch him just before he walked up. And here was one of the best preachers of the 20th century. And he was praying right before he went up those steps. And that was just not a nominal prayer. This is a man who understood the weight of the word and the weight of the pulpit and was in profound, deep prayer before he walked up those steps. I don't remember what Bishop Usel preached, 
But I do remember that prayer. I remember I was here for Richard Worden's first Sunday. I watched him kneel on those uh, kneelers right there as he began his ministry. And in addition, I have been uh, friends with many of the people who have been here over the years. I have had the chance to work with Beth Downs over the years and Steve Jones and Mark Ogren. They have been trusted friends and counselors for many years. I've had a chance to work with Jim Nolan. I was here for his first Sunday by chance and heard him preach that day. And the stories could go on and on and on. But what is important, you know, is that Reveille has been a real important part of my journey and Lynn's journey and our children's journey. And uh, we find it providential that in full circle we have the opportunity to come back and be a part of you and your ministry now. Well, friends, I just need to say um, that God is so good. And to be sure, right now in this season, we're going through it. We're dealing with the COVID challenge, we're dealing with racial tension, and multitudes of other challenges that, that come our way. We're going to address those things, and we're going to get to those things, and we're going to deal with all of that in the days and weeks and months to come. All that will come. But right now, we just recognize God's goodness and recognize that God has seen worse than what we're dealing with right now, and yet God still came down in Jesus and turned the water to wine. I am convinced, and I am in this business, because I don't believe that this miracle is finished. There's still plenty to do in my life, still plenty to do at Reveille, still plenty to do in all our churches, but what I am convinced of is that there are so many good things to come, not because of my goodness, not because of our goodness, because we serve a good God who is profound in love and has come down that our joy may be full. I am convinced that our risen Lord can still do it. He can still turn the water to wine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.